Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is, I think, necessary to begin by pointing out that we sit just about six miles from the place where a terrible massacre was inflicted on our neighbors in the city just a few days ago. I'm very happy to stand here and be able to say a few words about Nureddin Farah, about whom I think I could probably say many more than a few words, and I shouldn't do so. Um, as you probably all know, Mr. Farah has won virtually every prestigious prize that can be given to a writer of significance around the world. Um, you also know that his career has spanned a very long number of years now. Thank you. Too close? A little close. Better? Uh, okay. I was, uh, I'm sorry I'm doing this because it's echoing back to me. I was going to simply remind you of certain uh, fundamental facts that may be of some use as you, as you listen here today. Um, Nordin Farah was born in Baidoa, which is about 250 kilometers from Mogadishu, uh, at a time in the immediate post-war period when Somalia was a land divided into Italian and British protectorates. Gradually, as he was a young person, the Somali Republic merged these uh, separate entities beginning around 1960, it was firmly established, but not long afterwards, it was the victim of a coup d'etat by an authoritarian regime led by Siad Barre. And it is because of Siad Barre that uh, Nureddin Farah found himself in exile from uh, Somalia for his own safety, and in order to be able to uh, carry out his often stated project of using his fiction to write the nature and history of Somalia for us and for the people of Somalia. I know that the common interest in Mr. Farah's work has centered on the political circumstances surrounding his writing and his career, but I urge you tonight and then when you read his books after tonight, to give special attention as well to the artistic originality of this writing. It is uh, presumptuous of me to make this statement because what I'm saying is to me also self-evident. That is, we have here one in his oeuvre and his collected works, we have here one of the truly uh, most important compilations of artistic achievement in language, in English language, that I know of in the last many, many years, a body of work that belongs not merely to writing about contemporary phenomena, but that in dealing with what looks like the contemporary also and significantly uh, joins the multiple canons of great writing that belong to different traditions, many of which intersect not only in the Horn of Africa because of imperialism and so on, but which also in turn cross themselves in Mr. Farah's own formation as a person who studied in South Asia and Italy, who learned to speak Somali and Arabic, who learned to write Somali script as an early person and who has absorbed and I think mastered the arts of writing that come from and are embodied in the greatest works of all those different traditions. There is, in other words, I think a great deal to chew on here, to learn from, and also to take great pleasure in. And I know tonight you will be hearing him read from one of the greatest works of the last several decades in English maps. So I ask you to welcome him.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to read a few passages from a novel that I published in 1985, 86. <coughs> I'm sorry that I'm not reading from, is there an echo? I can hear a terrible echo, and therefore reading with such nothing can be done about it, technically speaking. Would you like to try? It's just the way it sounds. We do it a little better in Africa, I can tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I'll do so. Uh, I have to remember that I am a guest and I should stop complaining. <laughs> okay, well, it's better now. It's a little better. What have you touched? Some buttons. Yeah, good. Well, I feel better because once you've tried to please me, then I should be happy that you've tried to please me. Uh, there is a story to nearly all my books, all my novels. Each novel has its own story. The story of maps is very different from the story of many of the other novels. The first draft of maps that I sold to the publisher was only a hundred and 80 pages long with the, para the epilogue missing. I went away and I started on another project, another book project, and forgot completely about the book when I received a letter from my agent in which he was saying, the editors are now waiting for the epilogue, which you promised you would submit six months ago. Where is it? I reread the novel from the beginning and then decided it needed to be rewritten. In three months, I gave them 450 pages, a novel that they did not buy and there was a question whether to continue honoring the contract or not. What made things a lot more complicated was I was living in a small country in West Africa called the Gambia. And in those days, 1985, there was no facts. There were only telexes. And you can imagine having someone whose English was not the most superb type in into telex the text of maps. By the time the telexes were collected, we can imagine from here all the way to nearly the airport of Pittsburgh, The publishing house, my editor was tearing his hair out. My agent was getting nervous. And they paid for me to fly out to London and to read the telex and to help them reorganize it. 
So that is the history of the novel at birth. What came later was even more complicated because when the novel came out for something like five to six years, no one, and I'm saying truly, no one was interested in any other novel that I had written. By then I had published six other novels and maps would have been the sixth or the seventh. And I felt as if my other books were becoming orphans, unloved, uncared for. So I requested the publisher to bring it out of print so that the other books could regain their lives. And it was only after that that the other books were reprinted and then they people began reading them. So this is a novel about which I am sometimes a little ambiguous. And the reason is because it's one of those books that take over your life. And once it takes over your life, you become helpless in that way. I won't read much, maximum probably 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for discussions, and you can ask me questions. If you don't ask me questions, be assured, I will ask you questions. The novel is written in three different persone, I, you, and he, in alternate chapters. So the first one that I will read, the passage that I will first read, is in the I person, and then I will read in the you persona, and so on and so forth. Thank you. <coughs> The man who was brought to circumcise me when my turn came made me sit alone, insisting that I read a few Quranic verses of my choice, and that I wait for him as he honed the knife he was going to use against a sharp stone he had come along with. I was overcome by fear. Fear of pain, fear of being lonely, fear of being separated from Misra. She wasn't there anyway. She wasn't allowed to come. In her place, an uncle came, one of my many uncles. The sticky saliva in my mouth, the drumming of fright beating in my ears, the numbness of my body wherever I touched, felt, my legs, my hands, my thighs, my sex, were pain. Then the man asked me to look up at the heaven and to concentrate on anything my eye fell on. There was an aperture in the clouds, and there was a bird which I spotted, a bird flying high and in haste towards the opening in the heaven. I concentrated on the bird's movement, concentrated on it, until it became a dot in the heavenly distance. To mask my fear, I invested all my energy in the look and the bird's flight again, but I couldn't see the bird. The bird's flight reminds me of similar flights of my own fantasies. 
When I looked again, I couldn't see the bird. I could only see a tapestry of clouds which was woven in order to provide this bird with a hiding place. The world, I told myself, was in my eyes and the, and the bird had flown away with it, carrying it in its beak, light as a straw, small as an atom. Now that I had lost sight of the bird, I wasn't sure if it was an eagle or a hawk. There was nothing but sunlight for a long while, and the sun was in my eye, and it blinded me to the rest of the cosmos until the bird re-emerged out of the sun's brightness, beautiful, feminine, playful, and it became again the center of my world, and I was inside of it, in flight, light as are children's fantasy, impervious to the realities surrounding me, and then suddenly, as bushfire, sunk. It is such a horrid territory, the territory of pain. And I crossed it alone. No thought of Misra, no amount of consolatory remarks made by the uncle who had come with me, and no verse of the Quran could have reduced the pain or eliminated it. Do I remember when the pain lodged in my body, which it lived in for almost a month thereafter? It entered my groin first. Or rather, that is what I seem to remember. I recall thinking that I had seen the bird's apparition and that the rest of the world had been small as a speck in the sky then the man pulled at the foreskin of my manhood, producing first in my groin, then in the remaining parts of my body, a pain so acute, my ears were set blaze with doloric flames. These flames spread gradually, then my feet felt frozen, my eyes warm with tears, my cheeks moist with crying, and my throat dry as a desert. It was only then that I looked and I saw blood, a pool of blood in whose waters I swam and which helped me cross to the other side so I'd become a man once for all. I saw the man break an egg. I couldn't tell why he did so. Perhaps the idea was to reduce the pain or help stop my losing any more blood. I thought that the white and yellow of the egg mixed well with my own blood and the colors which I saw, the beauty which I beheld, took the pain away for at least a few decisive seconds. Maybe my bare thighs were spotted with cold sprouts of pained hair, and I rubbed them, smoothing the hair erections so the blood would return. I was helped to stand, I don't remember by whom, and was led away from the spot I had been sitting on, possibly the eggshell with the hat my manhood wore, possibly not. Possibly, once the skin was pushed back, I was bandaged with cotton or some other similar material. Although I cannot remember anything except the pain which made me faint, I awoke alone on a bed. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mm. 
now I'll read a few passages uh, where the novel, in fact, begins in youth. You sit in contemplative posture, your features agonized, and your expressions pained. You sit for hours and hours and hours, sleepless, looking into darkness, hearing a small snore coming from the room next to yours. And you conjure a past, a past in which you see a horse drop its rider, a past in which you see a bird breaking out of its shell so it will fly into the heavens of freedom. Out of the same past emerges a man wrapped in a mantle with unpatched holes, each hole large as a window, and each window large as the secret to which you cling, as though you it were the only soul you possess. And you question, you challenge every thought which crosses your mind. Yes, you are a question to yourself. It is true. You've become a question to all those who meet you, those who know you, those who have any dealings with you. You doubt at times if you exist outside your own thoughts, outside your own head, or misfit. It appears as if you were a creature given birth to by notions formulated in heads, a creature brought into being by ideas. As though you were not a child born with the fortune and misfortune of its stars, a child bearing a name, breathing just like anybody else, a child whose activities are justifiably part of a people's past and present experience. You exist, you think, the way the heavenly bodies exist. For although one does extend one's finger and point at the heavens, one knows, yes, that's the word, one knows that that is not the heavens, unless, unless there are, in a sense, as many heavens as there are thinking beings, unless there are as many heavens as there are pointing fingers. At times when your uncle speaks about you in your presence, referring to you in the third person, and on occasion even taking the liberty of speaking on your behalf, you wonder if your existence is readily differentiable from creatures of fiction whom habit has taught one to talk off as if they were one's closest of friends. Creatures of fiction with whose manner of speech, reactions to situations, conditions of being, and with whose likes and dislikes when its folk tradition has made one familiar. From your limited knowledge of literature, you feel you are a blood relation of some of the names which come to mind, leap to the tongue at the thought of a young boy whose name is Askar and whose prodigious imagination is capable of wealthy signs of precocity because you are this young boy. And you sit contemplatively. Your mind journeys to a region where there are solid and prominent shadows which lived on behalf of others who had years before ceased to exist as beings. As you sit, your eyes open into themselves the way 
blind people's eyes tend to. Then you become numb of soul. In other words, you are not yourself, not quite yourself. Then the journey takes you through numerous doorways and you are able to call back to memory events which occurred long before you were a being yourself. Your travel leads you through forests without any clearing, to stone steps too numerous to count. Although when you reach the highest point, your exhaustion disappears the instant you see an old man, gray as his advanced years, negotiate the steps too. You remember now that in the wake of the old man, there was a girl, barely seven, following the old man as a goat follows a butcher, knowing what knives of destiny awaited. And you, you who had lain in wait unwashed, you who had lain untended to at birth, yes, you lay in wait as if in ambush until a woman who wasn't expecting you existed walked into the dark room in which you had been from the second you were born. You were a mess. You were a most terrible sight. The woman who found you described the chill of that dark room as a tomb. To her, the air suggested the dampness of a mortuary. You cried at her approaching and would not be calmed until she dipped you in the bathtub she had filled with warm water. Then she fed you on the draft of milk. Did anyone ever tell you what you looked like when the woman discovered you that dusk some 18 or so years ago? No. You wore on your head a hat of blood, which made you look like a masked clown. And around your neck, there were finger stains, perhaps a mother's. Nobody knows to this day whether she tried to kill you or not. You displayed a nervous strain and you began to relax only when embraced either by another person or dipped in warm water. When you did not cry, you searched with your hands up in the air for somebody to touch. When day broke, once the women had shared the secret of her discovery with a few of the other neighbors, the men took over and they prepared your mother for burial. Alone with you, Misra noticed that your eyes were full of mistrust. They focused on her. They stared at her hands suspiciously. Your eyes, she would say years later, journeyed through her. They journeyed beyond her. They traveled to a past of unfulfilled dreams. In short, your stare made her inadequate. There was an element of self-consciousness in the small thing I had found, she would say. It was so self-conscious, it moved its hands as if it would wipe away the tears and the mess it had been in. It moved its eyes, were not staring at me, she continued, as though to, rec it, uh, as though to apologize for its shortcomings. And what eyes, what hands. Thank you very much. Well, we have two choices. One is I read another a couple of more passages, or we stop, ask questions, talk a couple of minutes, and then I read some more. Which would you go for? This is a democratic institution, Trump is not here, so. <laughs> we, 
We could, I could also read from the third part of the trilogy, Secret, in Third of London. Which one are we for going for? Secret. Do I, does somebody have a copy of Secret? <laughs> I saw somebody holding Secret, a copy. No, there was one in the bookstore. Could I borrow it? I pay 10%. Uh, you'll have to give me a minute for me to find the passage. I haven't seen these books for a very, very long time, so. I'm looking for a scene that, you know, not all scenes read. Uh, as standalone texts, so I'm looking for it. Well, one other way is always, one can always read the Okay, I'll just read the few prologue, a few passages from the prologue. Um, here you need to know, I think, uh, you need to know a couple of names. One of them is Nonno, which in Italian means Grandpa, Sholongo, one of the characters, and Clamen, who is one of the main uh, characters in the novel. My name, Clumman, conjures up memories of a childhood infatuation with a girl four and a half years older than I, memories on the heels of which arrive other recollections. Like an easy answer to a seemingly difficult riddle, my name evokes surprising responses in many people especially when they hear it for the first time. Some, at the risk of sounding ignorant, have been known to wonder, well, what sort of a name is it? Kalaman? Give them a clue, as I am prone to do, and nudge them in the right direction, and you will observe that slowly, like a mysterious door opening, their faces widen with grins as self-conscious as a sparrow dipping its head in a river's mist. Then my interlocutors say, now why on earth did we not think of that? There was a brief period when I thought of altering my name altogether. I, at the time, I had been infatuated with Shalongo, whose animal powers were mightier than mine. I resented my squeamish behavior, not only because of our gender difference, but also because my mother held the girl's guts in ominous awe. Nono, my father's father, appeared at times to go out of his way to encourage my cultivating Shalongo's friendship arguing that it was salutary for a boy like me to meet a woman who was my equal. Then he would change the subject and engage my interest in the stars between irrelevant asides, point the Milky Way out to me and explain the myth behind it, indicating 20 old stations along the path of the moon and how each of those stations affected the weather and a person's identity. Shalongo was so dominating in my life, I could never say my own name in her presence without stammering. 
My mouth would open a little and my tongue would push itself up against my palate. Only I would either fail miserably in making the K sound or the in be incapable of getting to the I in the name before finally seizing up altogether. Unable to unjam my tongue, I had become aware of a feeling of despair and inner rage. Months would go by before I asked Nono why I could not stand up to Shalonga's mysterious power or couldn't just shrug off her spells like a water off a crow's back. He said, I gather that Shalonga was delivered by her mother when the stars were bivouacking at the most inauspicious occasion. She was born a Dugan, that is to say, a baby to be buried. And that was why her mother tried to do. She carried the infant into the bush and abandoned her there. But Chalongo survived and lived to haunt the village's conscience, especially her mother's. As Grandpa paused, perhaps to catch his breath, my mind jumped further ahead and was able to recall other versions fed by other memories. He went on, I cannot vouch for its truth, but in the version I heard, a lioness adopted and raised her together with her cubs, then abandoned her at the crossroads where some travelers found her. There they took her to the nearest settlement, which happened to be her mother's hamlet. You might think this far-fetched, but this is the stuff of which people's misfortunes are made. Myth galore. Then what happened? Rather than own up to any of this, Shalonga's mother committed suicide in the version I have. Now this is considered a most heinous crime among perhaps among peoples of the Muslim faith. And the mother was most ruthlessly punished. A corpse was left to rot out in the open heat of the sun. It was remarked by those present in the hamlet that even vultures did not dare go anywhere near a corpse. I remained silent. The girl's father turned up, Nono went on, a seaman on leave. Bizarre though it may seem, the villagers did not tell him the whole truth, only that he had, he had to slaughter several goats as part of a sacrifice, sacrificial ceremony for his own safe return and nothing about suicide nor did anyone bother to inform him that his daughter was born Dugan. Remember, she was always at sea when she came into the world. What happened after he slaughtered the goats, the sacrificial goats? He left the hamlet soon after that, taking his daughter away with him to a town where he married again, my grandfather explained. The new wife, supplied him with a son, Timir. But then all of a sudden, for reasons unknown, his young wife went insane. The relatives of the woman who had heard rumors about the Dugan girl painted superstitious, pointed superstitious fingers at Shalongo. The father consulted a Sabah who prescribed ostrich as a cure. How do you know all this, Grandpa? I said. He had a mischievous grin in his eyes as he said, I managed to glean all this from the ears of a legion of untold secrets. 
I took a sip of chilled water with a dash of tamarind in it, the same concoction being the wondrous secret drink with which Nonno, my grandfather, wet my lips at birth. My larynx loosened up, so did my pharynx, my voice organ bounced into action, with the Adam's apple jerking to life, functioning with the ease of a recently greased engine. And I sang the song, Shalongo had taught me. Do you have any idea why she makes you stammer when you speak your name, he asked. I explained in the hesitant language of a child of eight plus, that I believed that I had occasional seizures. Then I compared my stammer to hiccups with which it shared at least one feature. Then I responded positively to chilled water with a dash of tamarind juice. As though impressed, Nonna said, well done, my grandson. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm thinking enough reading. Okay, and then we, are, we can answer some questions. We can have more light from you. Yeah. If yeah. you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for one of our staff members or volunteers to come to you with a microphone. Thank you. The fact that you've chosen to read from your uh, your novel, does that mean you've made peace with the impact that it's had on your life? Uh, no. <laughs> no, because, you know, um, one's books are like one's relatives. They irritate you, they do all terrible things to you, they insult you behind your back, they insult you sometimes to your face, but you can't walk away from them. And then Christmas comes, and then another month comes, and then Halloween arrives, and there's always some reason or the other that you get reconnected, and that's what it is. I haven't seen these books for a very, very long time, and the reason is once I have written a book and it goes and becomes part of the public property, the book belongs to whoever buys it and whoever reads it. And I don't remember many of them. I don't quite remember. For example, when I was reading from the secrets or from maps, I couldn't actually remember how the sentence would end. This is why occasionally I was hesitating because I'm not quite familiar. When I am writing them, they are alive. And I am in, continu in continuous dialogue with them. But once I have written and they go into other people's hands, then I take pleasure in disowning them. And the only books that I care about are the ones that are not doing well. <laughs> if your child is sick, you care more about them until they feel better, and then you say, go out now, let me live my life. And that is the attitude that I have toward my books. When they do well, they stay on their own. Yes, please. I'm curious to know what birds mean to you um, in your life or in your culture? Because in your readings, I heard an eagle, a hawk, an ostrich, a crow, and a sparrow. Um, you and had metaphors. And there, are some, uh, there are some more, too. Yes. I'm sure, but th this is just in, in what I heard. And I'm wondering if, you know, as with the ancient Greeks, you see signs and portents. I, do, I do see signs and, uh, yes. Uh, animals feature a great deal in the books that I write. Uh, if there are two characters sitting and having a conversation, it's possible that a cat would walk in 
and do something that would tell one or the other of them that this is where they should go. And the reason is because we are in continuous communication with other beings and in acknowledgement of their presence, in acknowledgement of what they mean. Uh, it's, um, I would say, common in both African and North American Indian writing that animals figure both for their mythology as well as, you know, animals are there more often than not. It's possible that in North America you may have a dog sharing your bed, but you wouldn't allow a goat to come into your, <laughs> into your living room, whereas in Africa we have, you know, goats munching their way. Sometimes you would find your pair of socks, if you are careless, have gone, and they may be eaten by a hungry goat. So we have, we have a special, we haven't lost that contact, continuous, constant contact with animals. And the animal in us comes out and, you know, communicates quite often. Some are ominous, some are, you know, not so ominous. Uh, so the birds are, they, many of them help come to terms with one's imagination, with the future, with bad omens, with terrible things that are happening. You take refuge in the mention of them. You, uh, peacocks mean one thing. All these have mythical meaning, relationships with the human as such. And that, and because I have also, I was, English is my fourth language. So the languages that came before English also had other myths, and which is one of the things I live in a free world. I do not hesitate to borrow from other cultures, and that is quite, well, gives you liberty, the freedom to choose to think what you want. There's a gentleman. I was curious about the amount of intelligence and awareness uh, in maps that you ascribe to the young boy. I mean, as young as being an infant and his thinking about how he was born or how he came into life, which were obviously, I mean, that's not what an infant could typically think about. <coughs> and, and continuing up through the through the ages of three, four, six, you ascribe an awful lot of intelligence to the young boy and his, his relationship to Misra, and I was just curious about that. Well, first of all, um, there is the general belief among adults that children are not as intelligent as they actually are. Sometimes they may not have the words with which to express their intelligence. That's number one. Number two, it is possible, and I'm saying it is possible. It's possible that if you remember novels like Tindrum by Gunther Grass, or if you remember even Genesis in the Bible, the begat, begat, begats. All these lead you to think that there are some special people whose presence in the universe, in the world, and whose identity is not clear to us until they have come and gone. And Asuka is born with extraordinary intelligence, a rare phenomena in a place where everybody else is illiterate, unintelligent, and so on and so forth. And the reason is because myths, mythical figures, come into being in the absence of normal 
situation. Somalia has known nothing, Ethiopia and Somalia have known nothing but wars and conflicts and so on and so forth. And therefore there is the child who is born to lead these people onto a promised land. And he carries that burden of being the one who leads these people from their life of morass to one of intelligence. Uh, additionally, I could say to you that sometimes, sometimes uh, people say that the characters are always intelligent, they talk poetry. How is it that you, know, you write the kind of books in which people talk intelligently all the time? I have trust in people's intelligence sometimes, and I say, well, look, you know, we're not, and, and they, you know, it would be quite boring if we, if we all spoke in a pedestrian fashion, all of us. So Aska represents the unknown, the mysterious, the mythical figure, the one born to lead people out of the morass onto somewhere else. Uh, some of the myths, for example, um, in, the, in Africa, one of the myths is that a great hero was born. He did not want to come through the normal passage, you know, through the womb and be born like any other child. No, he was born through the little finger of his mother to indicate his specialness. And then he helps his community, leads them from that moment of morass onto something greater. So these are some of the things that I keep thinking about when I write novels like maps. And even secrets, there are situations in which you would think that this is really not possible. But they are possible if you can imagine that they are possible. Hey, thanks very much for the great reading. Uh, how much do you rewrite? Re, uh, rewrite uh, wh What you read seems very polished, and yet you were saying that you sent off a novel of 400 pages in three months. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually I rewrite at least four times, at least. Uh, and even when I sent the 400, 400 pages, at every opportunity that I can, I rewrite. One of the reasons why North of Dawn is not available now is because I was rewriting until the last minute. And in actual fact, some of the changes that I made two and a half hours before the printers, before it was sent to the printers, were still fussing about it. And then I sent some more, and then they said, stop it. <laughs> it can't happen. So it gives me pleasure to rewrite, and the reason is because I'm allowed to have one chance, one go at every text. And that enables me to, to do so. I rewrite them as many times as, as I can. And then I usually, the writing it usually takes a very, very short time, concentrated, feverish writing that takes place about four months. I would do a draft in four months from cover to cover, let it sit. I don't look at it for nearly a year, nearly a year, by which time, like either good wine or good Italian bread or French bread. Uh, you go back to it, it has taken shape in my head, another version, uh, rival to the one that I finished. And then without looking at the first version, which I did, the draft that I did in four months, I do a second draft, saying to myself that 
the only things that matter, the only passages that matter, are the ones that I remember. Meaning, if I don't remember it, it means nothing, really nothing. And then I do a third version without looking at the first and the second. When I am at the fourth, working on the fourth version, I open all these side by side and then look at them and then salvage a few things from here and there and then put them together, uh, compose the book like a piano piece and then send it off. And quite often, quite often, there are, because I also type fast, there are many words missing and so on and so forth. But the editor and I negotiate and we come to a, some kind of an understanding. And they're very kind to me, usually, usually. Great, we have time for one more question. Good evening, thank you so much for meeting. Um, I have two questions actually. The first question is, in I don't, uh, I don't see the questioner. Oh, here I am. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the first question is, um, as in this political situation we are in, I'm wondering how you go from point A to point B, if you've had any problems, if you have any concerns, any trepidations, and... In America, you mean? Yes. Yes. And uh, the second question that I have is um, actually referring to uh, some of the things that my husband has said. My husband is from Ethiopia, from Tigre, and um, uh, he's always concerned about the uh, lack of stability and um, warring going on in that country. And as someone, uh, uh, you have also a lot of international experience, and I'm wondering um, how you feel about what's going on in the world today, uh, what's going on in the United States today, if you have any reflections about uh, what's going on. So you personally and in just in general. Thank you. Well, the first question, uh, my place in this world and what do I think about what's happening in this world full of crisis. My next novel to be published on the 4th of December is actually about the confrontation between the radical Islamists and the right-wing neo-Nazi groups. Not in America, but not far away, in Norway. I don't know whether you've heard of a murderer, massacre called Breivik. So Breivik is one of the characters. And therefore, from where I am looking, and from where? From the advantage that I am writing, you can see quite clearly where my position is. And that is, small groups of right-wing, neo-Nazi, hard-right, call it what you want, and a small group of radical Islam and various other people are making our life, the majority of people in America and the rest of the world, making our life very difficult. My position, therefore, is that terrorists, uh, unreasonable right, hard right folks are not going to win because they're small in number. We form the majority. And all we have to do is to continue living in a democratic fashion, in peace with one another, and soldier on. So that's my uh, optimistic uh, position. With regard to the conflicts in the Horn of Africa and in most of these places, my position is absolutely very clear, too. 
and that is there's been change in Ethiopia recently with the new prime minister uh, that has opened the gates of all the prisons. Uh, and there is an openness and democracy blossoming in Ethiopia and Eritrea at the moment. In Eritrea, I was there a few, a couple of years ago, uh, tasked with the job of helping to release a journalist who was imprisoned there. I was not very successful, and one of the reasons why I was not successful was because the government wouldn't, would invite me, talk to me, but they would never listen to my, the advice which I tended to give. So I think Ethiopia or the Horn of Africa is moving in the right direction at the moment. And evidence of that is that I will actually go and live in that part of the world uh, from about April 2019 up to July 2019 in that area, working on a book probably on human rights and various other uh, democracy related topics. So there is hope. Ethiopia has never known in its 3,000, 4,000 history, has never known democracy. But then those who have known democracy, or think they have known democracy, like Americans, uh, deluding themselves that they were democratic for 100 years ago, which they were not, because women were not democratic, were not benefiting from democracy. Neither were American, black, African-American, uh, uh, you know, uh, folks. And so the delusion has just come to a challenge. Somebody is challenging that delusion and questioning. And therefore, one must question some of these things. And that's why we need always to question. And we need to go back and look at history and say, you know, 1885, America was democratic, I would say no, you see? And I would say no on the basis that women were out, men were out, lots of people were out. In England, they say democracy. No, it wasn't democracy. So democracy is a house that's being built slowly, gradually, with everyone possibly coming from the cold into the shelter. And if ever anybody is outside the sheltered space, there is no democracy, regardless of what the Constitution says, right? And so we have a long, long way to go. In Ethiopia, in the Horn of Africa, we have a long, long way to go. In America, you too have a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So as a quick thank you from City of Asylum for joining us this evening, we are so pleased to offer you this T-shirt. <laughs> Is it my size? Well, if it's not, you can swap it out. <laughs> but thank you for joining us. And thank you all for joining us here tonight.